There are some events in history which become unforgettable down the timeline. Some victories proved to be turning points for some nations where the course of destiny has changed from decline to rising up. The victory of the Dardanelles was one of those events which has not been forgotten and which should not be. A nation can be considered victorious if and only if they can carry across their victory to future generations. History is already overflowing with countless victories which have been left to oblivion. It is only a temporary victory if the spirit and enthusiasm that brought it cannot be conveyed to the young. Recording history is as important as making history. Along the same line, reading what is recorded is important to the same degree. Otherwise, the nation will be deprived of the wisdom that historical experience brings, and consequently, the future of the nation is likely to be dark. The Dardanelles was a battle of life or death, which was was won after a final attempt by the Turkish nation, who united for one goal after centuries of defeats, failures, civil conflicts, and fights between brothers. The Dardanelles is a secret of people who ran after martyrdom, forsaking all kinds of worldly pleasures to save the future of their nation, beloved children, the grandchildren whom they would never see, and for some values they wholeheartedly believed in. How did it all this happen? First established in Anatolia in the 13th century, the Ottomans became the only superpower in the world as of the 16th century. In order to put an end to Ottoman expansion and dominant political influence as well as to find ways to feed their overpopulated nations, European countries started searching for new resources. The decline that was observed in education and scientific research in the 17th and 18th century started to be felt in every state department. It was later followed by corruption in Ottoman scientific circles which lagged far behind European technology. Defeats on the battlefield came soon enough and the Ottoman Empire evaporated away against greedy and expansionist Europeans. By the 19th century, no land on the surface of the earth was left untouched by the colonial powers of industrialized Europe. Toward the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century, these colonial powers were challenging each other in a severe competition to obtain the biggest share from the Ottoman territories as much as they could. In time, this competition brought about camps of new interest groups, ending past hostilities in Europe. On one hand, the Allied powers were formed by England, France, and Russia. And on the other hand, there was Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy, Bulgaria, and later the Ottoman Empire joined forces for the Central Powers. Under the leadership of England, the Allied powers were joined by 12 countries, including Italy, which later changed sides. When translated into military terms, this alliance was an armed force of 42,188,810 troops, whereas the German-led Central Powers could only bring together 22,850,000 together, including the Ottoman Empire. The developments in the technology of weapons since the mid-19th century had a great influence in the naval forces and ships made of wood were replaced by those made of steel. In 1895, the British sent off the first battleship named HMS Dreadnought, which was armored with steel from head to toe and armed with many guns. The design of the Dreadnought was so revolutionary that all similar warships were also called Dreadnoughts. Just to describe the capacity of a Dreadnought, the example of the Queen Elizabeth, which came to the Dardanelles under the British banner ship Suffice. This Dreadnought was 197 meters long, 28 meters wide, and weighed 33,000 tons. There were eight 380 millimeter guns, each as big as one average size man, with bullets as heavy as a half a ton. Another set of 152 millimeter guns numbered 16 on this battleship. The guns could fire a projectile more than 
20 kilometers. The shield of this dreadnought was armored by plates 80 centimeters thick on certain parts of the ship's surface. It was all in all like a fortress made of steel and a death machine. On the other hand, these battleships were so expensive that even England, as the richest country with more than one-fourth of the entire world under her rule, only had 26 dreadnoughts. Therefore, it was more important to keep these ships floating rather than having them in battles. Under the pressure of newly developed weapons and political tensions, Europe was like a dynamite ready to explode by the year 1914. The sparkle was not too late. The crown prince of the Austria-Hungary Empire, Franz Joseph, and his wife were assassinated by Princip, a young Serbian nationalist. During their visit to Sarajevo on July 28, 1914, this was to start the bloodiest war with the largest dimensions unrecorded until that time in world history. In the meantime, the Ottoman Empire was looking forward to receiving two dreadnoughts named the Shehzade Osman and the Rashadiyeh, which were commissioned in England. The Turkish Navy was going to be a leading power in the Mediterranean and the Black Sea. Having noticed this potential, Winston Churchill, first Lord of Admiralty, decided to confiscate these dreadnoughts, violating international law. Informed by Turkish intelligence about this confiscation, Enver Pasha, the Minister of War and Deputy Chief of staff wanted to benefit from this situation with favorable tactics instead of submitting to what happened. The German ambassador to Istanbul, Wangenheim, was summoned to a meeting and he proposed that these two dreadnoughts could be given to the German Navy if the Germans were to accept an alliance with Turkey. Hearing this generous offer by what German naval forces would become superior to that of the British, Wangenheim contacted Berlin and in a short time, an agreement was reached. According to this agreement, Turkey was to fight against Russia only if it was attacked by them. In return for these two dreadnought, the Germans ordered the Goeben, a dreadnought cruiser, and the Breslau, and a companion cruiser from their Mediterranean fleet to sail off to the Dardanelles. The British Navy was behind them. After these two battleships, which were among the biggest and the most modern cruisers of the German fleet, entered the Dardanelles on August 10, 1914, and the strait was then closed to sea traffic. It was not much later that German intelligence discovered the British confiscation of Turkish battleships. Wangenheim demanded the German cruisers back from Turkey, but he had to accept Jamal Pasha's proposal to sell them to the Ottomans at a very cheap price. After a flag-raising ceremony, the bigger cruiser, Göben, was named Yavuz Sultan Selim, and the other one, Breslau, was named Midilli. The British fleet, which chased these cruisers until the Dardanelles, violated Turkish territorial waters and provoked Turkish armed forces after a Shovi maneuver, they moved toward Gökçada, Imros. Although the Ottoman Empire was neutral at the time, the British and the French started preparations for war at the entrance of the Dardanelles. They continued provoking Turkish battleships and did not let any vessel leave the strait. In the meantime, Yavuz and Midilli had reached Istanbul, and by the order of Enver Pasha, they sailed off to the Black Sea for maneuvers. The Turkish fleet was led by Admiral Zushan, the captain of the Yavuz. The Turkish Navy intended to provoke the Russian Navy to attack, which would provide the Turks with a reason to open a front exclusively against Russia without waging war against the British and the French, who were then conceding one defeat after another from the Germans, so that they could retaliate for past defeats and reclaim lost territories. However, Admiral Zushan took certain undisclosed orders from Berlin, and he attacked semi-civil targets like the Odessa, Sevastopol, and Feodicia ports with no reason, so that Ottomans would find themselves involved in the war. In a short time between November 2nd to 7th, 1914, Russia Britain, France, Japan, and Belgium declared war against the Ottoman Empire. The failure of the Russian armies against Germans 
put the Russians in a very difficult situation. The possibility of Russian withdrawal from the war, and more importantly, the famine that arose in Europe, urged the British War Cabinet to seek solutions. Winston Churchill had the bright idea to capture Istanbul after a sudden attack in the Dardanelles. In this way, losing its capital, the Ottoman Empire would be disqualified from the war with one blow and Russian wet could be carried to Europe with no obstacle. Also, Germany would be surrounded from all corners and left with no choice but to surrender. This seemed to be a great idea. After discussions for some time, the cabinet passed this proposal with fervent speeches. For instance, Lord Kitchener, the Minister of War said, if one of the submarines were to rise to the sea surface and wave our flag across the Gallipoli town, the Turkish garrison on the peninsula would find themselves in Bolayr in no time flat. Winston Churchill compared this battle to a second Trojan War. He asserted that the British were the only representatives of an ancient Greek civilization, and they would kick out the barbarian Turks from Anatolia, pushing them back to Central Asia. This association was frequently referred to in the British press. The first battleship to enter the Dardanelles Strait was the Queen Elizabeth as the modern representative of ancient Greek culture, followed by the Agamemnon, named after a Greek king who started the Trojan War. Ironically, the first battleship to escape the war was going to be the Agamemnon. The British started preparations for war without delay, and Admiral Cardin was assigned to lead the Royal Navy. The following quotes from the young British poet, Rupert Brooke, who volunteered for this battle, is worth mentioning to reflect the British approach to the battle. This is fantastic. I never expected that our fate would help us this much. We are off and going. The Galata Tower will be demolished with our 15-inch guns. The sea will be red and full of courses. We will plunder the mosaics and carpets of Hagia Sophia. Turkish girls will be mine. I believe I will witness the end of an era. Oh God, I was never so happy in my life. On November 3rd, 1914, upon an order from London, the giant battleships of Britain started battering Seddul Bahir and Kumkale forts at the entrance of the strait. During this initial bombardment, the artillery in Seddul Bahir exploded, killing five officers and 81 privates. The number of guns, even in only one of the battleships, were more than the number of weapons in these two forts. Following this, the Turkish chief of staff initiated major preparations to defend an imminent British challenge of the strait. The Royal Navy in Britain and French Navy fleets had set sail from their ports both in Britain and France, as well as from the Mediterranean, heading toward the Dardanelles since January. These fleets were also cruising in the direction of Limni and Gökçada toward the north of the Aegean Sea. With the entrance of the Ottoman Empire into the war, the entire country was immobilized, and both the young and old were rushing to the battlefront. Even the students who were studying their masters and PhD degrees in Europe or in Turkey, various universities and high schools abandoned all their life goals and ran to straight. The Allied challenge by the French and the British to the Dardanelles, which was considered to be the lock to the gate of Istanbul, aroused nationwide indignation. Behzat Kerim Efendi noted down the following before he left Istanbul. Oh, I have accomplished my goal. I will sacrifice my life for my religion, country, and Istanbul where I had joyful and delighted memories of my life because I'm going to the Dardanelles, the castle of iron and blood. I'm delighted. I know that as I defend Istanbul, this land of caliphs, and the greatest sultans, I will break the evil hands of those who want to spoil the serenity of my old father, the life of my innocent baby, 
the chastity of my beloved Nebibe, or the blessed tomb of my mother, whom I never saw, Marquise Effendi. Peace be upon you. O oh, Istanbul, the Kaaba of my heart, those on the way to death are saying farewell to you. The children would cry to their fathers, Don't go, Daddy. And they were answered, This is for you and for the nation. Every person is a world of its own. In the Dardanelles, every person is an epic. The Turkish nation sang songs for those sent to the battlefront. One of these songs was Hey 15. Hey 15, 15. The streets of Tokat are stony. The 15s are going. Their beloveds. Eyes are watering. This song was dedicated to the 15 year old children of Tokat who left town for the Dardanelles. The plunderers were on one side and those defending their country on the other during January and February 1914. The ports of Limni, Mondros and Gökçada were filled with so many battleships that a foreigner to the islands could easily assume them to be the ports from developed European countries. The British Navy brought approximately 230 ships to Limni and Gökçada, 48 of them warships. It was a thrilling commotion in the Mondros port of Limni, with more than 20 submarines, 14 aircraft carriers, more than 50 aircraft and zeppelins. Their numbers were subject to constant change. This was also valid for Gökçada. The Dardanelles Strait, on the other hand, was getting ready for defense with the installation of batteries, mobile cannons, and 11 lines of mines along the strait. A few Turkish warships, like the Turgutris and Barbaros Hayrettin, were also brought to the offshore Çanakkale. The Dardanelles was under the command of Cevat Pasha. February 19, 1915, at 10 a.m., some of the British floating fortresses started firing at the Said Dulbahir and Arturul batteries on one side, while another set of warships fired at the Kumkale and Orhaniye batteries. How astonishing a duel it is between a dreadnought and a battery with two cannons, each older than 15 to 20 years. The British aircrafts were also dropping bombs and nails. After conceding some shots, the Allied fleets withdrew to come back again every day at the same time to throw up fire. On February 25th, 1915. They challenged another of our batteries at the entrance to the strait. When they were shot once again, they preferred to withdraw. However, these batteries were severely damaged, no longer able to further resistance. Their mission was handed over to the batteries positioned in the inner strait. The bombs and nails dropped from the aircrafts impaired our soldiers. Although air defense shots were quite successful, causing the expensive aircraft of the British to fall. After February 25th, the Allied fleet perpetually postponed the collective attack on the strait due to unfavorable weather conditions. The cruiser named Nusret, under the command of Captain Tophaneli Hakkabe, laid 26 mines in the cold waters of the strait all along the shore during the night of March 7th and 8th. The British aircrafts and minesweepers would not notice them until the 18th of March. Admiral Carden, commanding the British-French fleet, later suffered from depression and was removed from his mission as he thought the possibility of a defeat was more likely to happen. He was replaced with his deputy Admiral John de Robeck, who was a more passionate person. John de Robeck said in one of his telegrams to London that if the weather goes well, he was going to be in Istanbul in two weeks. In the course of all this, 
agents in Britain started to sell travel tickets for Istanbul. Banknotes that were to be used after the invasion of Turkey were minted, and minorities in Istanbul were preparing to host the British. The aircraft sent by Germany to the Turkish armed forces were positioned in the Dardanelles. Although there were still signs of German crosses on the plane, Captain Cerno came to the Dardanelles on March 17th to command these warplanes, Captain Cerno took off in the morning of March 18th for a test. In the meantime, the Allied fleet departed toward the strait. Captain Cerno's flight was so useful that all the weapons were put on alarm at the strait, and thus the Turkish army would not be caught unprepared. The Allied fleet was coming with all its glory. The large warships formed three lines, smaller accompanying cruisers, torpedo ships spread across the sea. The big day came and the big sea war started. The first line of ships entered the strait at 10.30 a.m. The pride of the Royal Navy was at the very front, followed by the Agamemnon, named after the greedy king of Greece in the legendary epic by Homer. And then came the Lord Nelson, the inflexible, the Prince George, and the Triumph. They fired with all their power. The French fleet, which formed the second line with the Goliath, the Charlemagne, the Bouffe, and the Suffren entered the strait behind the British. The battle was becoming severe. The Turkish artillery only had 17 cannons against the 186 guns of the British-French Allied forces. It was an interesting competition between the naval artillery. Admiral John de Robek, who commanded the fleet from the Queen Elizabeth, ordered the French to move to the front. The Queen Elizabeth did not only fire at batteries, but also civil targets at the city of the Dardanelles. The projectiles fired from the British guns opened cavities on the ground with a diameter as wide as 12 meters and 4 meters deep. Right in the middle of the heat of the battle, a British torpedo cruiser was shot and sank with higher motivation. The Turkish side fired perpetually, raising water columns among the ships. However, there was also the concern that they could run out of arsenal any time. Not too much later, the booth was also shot and started to sink after lying on one side. The Turkish side stopped firing so as not to harm the French soldiers that fell off board the ship. The British stopped firing too for a while, but this interval did not last too long. Then, the British fleet came to the front and the French fleet moved back. The remaining British cruisers in the third line entered the strait. Their names were the Majestic, the Vengeance, the Irresistible, the Albion, the Ocean, the Swift Shore. After entering the strait, the ocean completely destroyed Rumeli Mejidie battery and was looking for another target, Corporal Seed, from this battery, in the face of the pierced courses of his friends, overflowed with an extraordinary power and lifted a projectile which weighed 215 kilograms and fired immediately. The ocean was shot with a big explosion and sank in a few minutes after hitting some of the mines laid by the Muslims. The morale of the British soldiers was getting worse. The Turkish artillerymen, on the other hand, were in high spirits. The Agamemnon, which was under the risk of sinking because of the serious damage to his body, was the first ship to flee the strait. Three more torpedo ships sank after they were shot. The Irresistible, which was coming for backing up the battleships in front, also sank due to the mines laid by Nusret within a matter of minutes. 
When the Queen Elizabeth started dragging away with the effect of the damage from the battle, the British completely lost morale. Then the Vice Admiral John de Rubick gave the order of withdrawal, bewildered with thoughts about the pride of the British Army and how he would account for such expensive ships. Toward the dusk, the victory belonged to the Turks. However, Churchill would not give up easily. He had given an order stating that they were going to pass that strait no matter how many ships and people it cost. The Allied forces who understood that it was impossible to pass the straits from the sea decided to make a land raid and continue their advance after having neutralized the artillery. After all, better late than never, as they say. To this end, they brought nearly half a million people from all over the world. 410,000 on the British side and 79,000 on the French side. In addition, the British formed a base in Egypt and transferred the soldiers they brought to the Gökçada and Limni Islands. General Ian Hamilton was the commander, and they thought he was sure to succeed. The plan was simple. They were going to simultaneously disembark at three spots. When one of the groups distracted the Turkish soldiers, the others would take the peninsula under control. Accordingly, the French would be the bait and disembark at Kumkale. The Anzacs were going to disembark at Aruburnu and the British at Seddül Bahir. The Anzacs would take the Kojachmen hill, which was the highest and most strategic spot, whereas the British would take Alçatepe hill and control the area around Kilit Bahir. In the meantime, the German general Lehmann von Sanders was assigned as the commander of the Turkish forces in Gallipoli. On 25th, April 1915, they disembarked at three spots at dawn. The French disembarked at Kumkale. When they tried to advance under the backup fire of the French battleships, they were pinned to the coast by severe Turkish resistance. After some time, they had to withdraw. At the same time, the Anzacs disembarked at Aruburnu, and the Turkish troops were not unprepared. The Anzacs were having difficulty in proceeding on the steep hill. However, the Turks were few in number, and they ran out of ammunition in a short time. The regiment was withdrawing, for they had no ammunition left. It was a very critical moment of the war. The commander of 19th Division, Colonel Mustafa Kemal, intervened and asked the withdrawing soldiers, where are you going? The enemy is coming, sir. We have no ammunition left. If you don't have the ammunition, you have your bayonets. Bayonets on, lie down. It was the moment we won. When the Turkish soldiers stopped withdrawing and lay down, the enemy also lay down. At that time, Turkish backup forces arrived. The Anzacs were pinned at the coast under the severe resistance. The Turkish troops were defending the area, heart and soul, in spite of the forceful fire of the ships. Again, at the same time that day, the British wanted to approach Arturube with the collier ship, the River Clyde, they nicknamed the Trojan Horse. Because of the 2,000 soldiers hidden inside, they planned to neutralize the Turkish guards with a sudden attack. But there was an unexpected problem. They faced a great obstacle. Anyone stepping out was dropped dead by the fire from the Turkish side. As a response, the British Navy started a violent bombardment and the ships started disembarking soldiers. The British soldiers, who were not able to advance against a fierce defense, were obliged to position on the coast. The obstacle they came across was Sergeant Yahya of Ezine and his 63 friends. Sergeant Yahya and his friends stopped the advance of the British forces, and this gave a day to the Turkish troops behind the firing line in order to form a line of defense. The British commander Hunter Weston had thought 
that they were fighting against thousands of people and the cannonballs they fired at the hill amounted to 4,650. In the evening, when he learned the number of the Turkish martyrs on the hill, he could not hide his astonishment and he was anxious until the end of the war. Disembarking at several spots in Seddul Bahir simultaneously, the British and the French managed to position at the tip of the peninsula. As for the British Air Force, they did not only bombard the battleground, but they also bombarded civil residence areas, Chanakkale being the first, mosques, even hospitals, and many innocent people were killed. The Turkish planes, which were very few in number, were bombing the British military targets and were doing all they could, along with fighting the British aircrafts. The battles ceaselessly continued.